Hello, and welcome to the Young Black Female Professionals panel. We have Chandra Clark and Brisha Allen, Tanisha Edwards here today as panelists, and me, Zebney Davis, as your moderator. Um, I'm gonna let these beautiful women introduce themselves, and then we're gonna ask them some questions about working as black female professionals. So my name is Ambrisha Allen. Um, I was born and raised in Tifton, Georgia. Um, I have three kids. I have a one-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 13-year-old. Um, I have a husband. We live in Valdosta, Georgia, and I started my education right here at ABAC in 2007. <laughs> So um, I started here and then I transferred to Valdosta State and that's where I received my graduate degree and my undergrad as well. And um, then I started my work career and the rest is history. <laughs> um, good evening everyone, my name is Tanisha Edwards. I was actually born and raised in Tampa, Florida. Once I got to high school, I went to high school right down the road, Sylvester. I started my educational career here at ABAC in 2007, I believe, and I transferred to Albany State where I attained my BA and my master's, and I'm currently employed with the Department of Community Supervision. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chandra Clark. I currently am the Executive Director of the Tipton Housing Authority here in Tipton. Um, I've been in this position for 22 years. Prior to serving at the Tipton Housing Authority, I worked at the Albany, Georgia Housing Authority for almost seven years. Uh, I went to college at Stillman uh, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I have a degree in business with an emphasis in accounting and a master's degree in public policy and administration from uh, Mississippi State University. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Okay, sorry, that's a little. Oh, I feel a bit coming up. This is so unprofessional for professional women. Okay. <laughs> But, um, okay, so the first question is, how important is it to see black representation in all of your respective fields? Um, for mine, I'm a health equity navigator, so what we do is we go out in the, into the community, we do a lot of outreach events. We do events at churches, festivals, um, events here at ABAC. We've done some here at Valdosta State. And just being out in the community, like being a part of underserved communities, it's very important for them to see someone of color represent them. Um, we've gotten so many, because it's not just myself, it's my coworker as well. We've gotten so many questions about, you know, what would you do, um, asking our, our opinion on things, and just them being appreciative to see some of us out in the community. Because with, um, I work with Department of Public Health, my apologies, Department of Public Health, the South Health District, and our position is fairly new. So just going out and being in the community, being represented, and them seeing us, and them seeing us out a part of the community, it's, it's very well appreciated. So we've gotten a lot of love, a lot of um, good positive thoughts, and a lot of good feedback from it as well. Um, as for me, I work with probation, parole, um, felonies, and I work with the substance abuse population. I'm a substance abuse counselor. Um, for me, it's very important that um, African American women are represented because that was a male, a Caucasian male dominated um, career. So for me to have my face and other women of color in my profession is, is um, very important because sometimes we can't relate. You know, so they can, my male clients can relate to me um, and they'll tell me certain things versus what they wouldn't if I wasn't a woman of color. So it's, it, it's very good to me and important to me to be represented like that. Okay, so when I did my interview for the Tipton Housing Authority, the board asked me a question. Well, no, they asked could I be a role model for the residents? And so, of course, I accepted challenge. Um, most of the residents are headed by um, black females, uh, most of the households. And so it's very important that they can see me because if they see me, then they know that they can accomplish as well. Uh, when I first started in this industry, I think there were two, 
there were two um, uh, black female executive directors, and now there are several. Um, and it, it, so it's very important. It was important to me to be able to uh, get those women to serve as mentors for me. I think there were two black women in the field. So it helped me grow. And so now I get the opportunity to help others. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, another question. Um, do you feel like you have had to work harder than your non African American counterparts at any time? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will say that. Um, Prior to me being a health equity navigator with the South Health District, I've had several state jobs and I've also worked at hospitals. Um, I'll take it back to when I was a social worker at South Georgia Medical Center. I served in that position for nine months. And honestly, that was my ideal job. Um, I went to school, I was like, I'm gonna retire being a social worker. So when I got the opportunity to go and interview for it, I was extremely excited. So when I got the job and I went out in the field, the feeling wasn't reciprocated. Um, it wasn't reciprocated um, from a lot of the doctors, um, a lot of the other staff at the hospital. And I mean, it was kind of like an eye opener, but it, it gave me that push, that motivation to say, okay, I'm in this position for a reason. God got me here for a reason. This is what I want to do. And I did it. I was one of the best social workers when I left. They didn't want me to leave. And I feel like I made a name for myself. I made an uh, opportunity for other African-American women to come in into that position. And even if, you know, that was their first time being in a professional setting, um, I feel like I was able to open that gap and um, represent for us. And, and like her, I was I, I worked in um, a lot of state jobs, and I was met with a lot of opposition and resistance. Um, sometimes I was getting a very heavy caseload, like set me up for failure, and I prevailed. I didn't fail. And like her, when I left that agency, they didn't want me to leave. Um, but it was like I always had to go that extra step versus my Caucasian um, coworkers. It was. <laughs> so for me, I think I work with architects and contractors, and a lot of um, them are Caucasian. And so most of the time when I walk into the room, I think they think I'm the secretary uh, or the, the administrative assistant. And so they don't speak until they realize I'm the person signing the check. So there, in that sense, yes, there has been some difficulties. Um, but it's mostly just been surprised. Uh, once, once they realize um, it's, it's not so much difficult that it's, it's just more surprise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a question that I really, really wanted to ask. Um, if I can find it, so I don't mess it up, watch <laughs> it. Do you feel like um, you've had to struggle with maintaining respect and boundaries and trying to not seem too aggressive or trying to seem non-aggressive at all? For me, I would say no, because just my personality itself, I'm a very humble person. So I don't go into a position or a room um, just like I know it all. I'm the person I'm gonna sit possibly in the middle. I'm gonna soak in everything that I know and I'm gonna ask questions. So just my personality itself is very humble. So I would say no. Well, with me, I work in the criminal justice field. Again, it's a male dominated. So I have um, had the aggressive behavior from my, from my males. I have had the remarks. And because I was in a professional setting, even though they were unprofessional, I had to remain professional. Um, generally, I working at the prison in a dorm, it's me and my male Caucasian part and certain things would be said. And I had to learn how to uh, be assertive um, in that. Um, did not have to file sexual harassment charges, but it got very, 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 very close to it. Um, and it was hard. I eventually left the prison, figured out that wasn't for me, that, was, that wasn't my, my thing. But um, I also worked with uh, farmers. I was asked, could I come clean their house? 
you know, as like her, it was like I was the help instead of until they found out I was the one passing out the checks and giving out. You had to go through me before you could. So, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Can you repeat your question for me? Basically, I was asking, um, do you feel like you've had to struggle with maintaining respect um, and boundaries and trying to seem unaggressive? Because I know a lot of times as black women, we have to seem almost passive so that way no one will like be up in arms about how we act. Um, so. Uh, no, I have not had any issues maintaining respect um, or boundaries. I have not had that issue. I think in some cases, someone may view me as aggressive rather than assertive, but not necessarily say it. But body language says a lot. Mm -hmm. Body language and tone of voice says a lot. Um, so. I can't say that anybody has said that, but I have seen it kind of acted out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> 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 um, another question is, what does thriving look like in the workplace for black women? I <laughs> <laughs> so, thriving, in my mind, is being courageous, is being able to stand in your truth. Um, oftentimes, we think being fearful and being courageous can't operate together, but that's not correct. In my mind, that's my opinion, that's not correct. Being courageous is overcoming the fear anyway, and that's what thriving looks like to me. Um, that's what success looks like to me, being able to stand in your truth and to be able to speak truth to power. Um, yeah, that's kind of what thriving looks like. To me, it's not necessarily about money. It's not about position. It's just about being able to do what you need to do at any given point. Awesome. <laughs> and I, I agree with her because even if you take a position and you know you don't agree with it, being able to execute it the way that needs to be done, um, it says a lot. Um, I'll say my position now, um, whenever I took the position, it was a fairly new position. It was actually a new position that they put in place. So my supervisor, she was, she's not a micromanager. She's just like, you make this position yours. And honestly, I didn't know what to do. Like I have a social work background, so Mine is the nurturing. Mine is the going out and, you know, seeing what's needed in our communities, being able to offer those resources in the community. So me being able to thrive in a position that I don't know anything about, it was a challenge for me. But by me going, asking her different questions, me just suggesting, okay, well, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that, being able to go and see the benefit of it from the community that is rewarding to me. So to me, that's what thriving looks like in my eyes. Yeah, and I, I kind of agree with both of them. Being a social, social substance abuse counselor and working with um, convicted felons, you, you have that, it's that broad line. You want to be nurturing, but you got to be firm, fair, and consistent. And sometimes it's like the nurturing part takes over, but then I have to kind of back back. But I don't want to lose myself or my morals or anything um, because some of them come in and it's that stigma attached to their drug use and sometimes I just immediately want to just say okay it's gonna be all right mm -hmm. but I can't let what I see other people doing um, mistreat them it's person-centered you know you want to treat them like a person so to me thriving is, is hanging on to my morals um, my values and, and incorporating that on my clients. That is so good. Thank you guys. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay. How do you advise black women to approach conversations about negotiating for um, a higher salary or asking for a raise? <laughs> <laughs> I say know your worth. Um, know your worth. There is nothing wrong with negotiating what you feel like um, you're worth. Myself, um, when I I left 
one state agency into another and I was very qualified, but they was keeping me at my pay. And so I had to go in and say, hey, I'm doing this, 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 all this work, and you know, I feel like I need a raise. So they said, well, let me find some money. And I got my raise. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we as people or as women, I should say, sometimes we're kind of fearful of, of asking it, but get paid with your worth. Mm -hmm. get, get your worth. I agree. I agree. Um, I was actually presented with a position and the work that was involved in the position versus what they were willing to pay, I was not agreeable to that. And I said, I'm worth more than that. And at the end of the day, I ended up turning down the position because they weren't willing to pay. But even though I turned that down, God came and blessed me with a different one that rewarded me double. So I agree with that. Know your worth, know what you're valued, um, and don't feel afraid to execute that. Okay, so let me start with when you're starting out, when you're, when you're new in the workforce. When I started out, I didn't care what my pay was. I wanted to learn everything I could, uh, and I think that's important. Um, you, you need to build your build your toolbox, so to speak. And so the money will come. The money will come. Now, that being said, after my first job, when I didn't care what I made because I wanted to build my skill set, when I went to my second job, I did negotiate because I had all that background. And there and you absolutely have to. You absolutely have to negotiate on the front end because if you don't negotiate on the front end, you're not going to get it. Um, so I think you have to know your worth. You have to know that you are enough. You have to know that you have the proper skill set to do the job. And then, then go for it. Okay. Wouldn't that be nice on a sticker? Know your worth. <laughs> <laughs> or a shirt. Yeah, or, or a shirt. shirt. <laughs> okay, Abeck. We need, we need, we need, you know, we'll get some money. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> what are the biggest obstacles that black women confront as they look to advance into leadership roles? What's the biggest obstacle that, that black women confront as they look to advance into leadership roles? Let me, let me <laughs> say this. When I started at the Albany Housing Authority, I, did, I started as an analyst, a uh, budget analyst, which was short, which was code for intern. Um, but within three months, I was given a supervisory position. So it wasn't, uh, it was just navigating how do, I be, how, be, how do I become a good leader. I was kind of thrust into it. Um, so I can't say that I had any obstacles to moving into leadership. Uh, when I started there, in September, three months later, the my supervisor left. Then there was a reorganization in the agency, and a, uh, departments were created. And my uh, CEO asked if I wanted to leave the finance department, and so I was just kind of thrust into it. So you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I'm in a male kind of like male dominated as far as chiefs and all of that. Um, when I was at the prison, what I would notice is that everything operated on a buddy system. If you wasn't in that clique, or if you wasn't a male, uh, particularly Caucasian male, then you going up for a, a sergeant position or a lieutenant position or any type of laundry detail, it's like, they would, to me, they would find like, okay, so you don't have enough experience right now. You would try again when something else comes up. So for, for me, it was like for women advancing in a male-dominated career, it was always the testosterone for me. It's like, okay. And as far as me, um, I want to go back to when I worked with DFACS, because I worked with DFACS for two and a half years. And the positions were there. Like, if you knew your work, if you knew your job, your position, and you knew what was required of you, the opportunities are there. So I would say you would stand in the way of yourself from getting those positions. But I've also seen cliques. I've also seen them 
um, offer those jobs to their friends or their um, counterparts or people they feel would be best for the position versus one of us, you know, being well qualified, experienced, and all of that. So, yeah, I would just say that. Okay. So it basically goes back to working harder for all services. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, as African American women, how do you take care of your mental health while maintaining your careers? Self care. <laughs> plenty, plenty, plenty of, of self care. And it doesn't have to involve money. Um, this weekend, I plan on cutting off my cell phone, and I'm just going to catch up on my reading because I love to read. Um, or it could be something simple as cooking something that I like. Um, but self to me, self-care and mental health, is, is it, you have to take care of it. You have to. That is absolutely <clears throat> key uh, for me. I love to travel, and I don't care where it is. I want to travel to somewhere new every year. And it can be the small, it can be a town with 50 people. If I've never seen it before, it does something for me mentally. Mm-hmm. Um, so travel, music does a lot. I love music, all kinds. And so I may just put on my favorite CD. Or, yo, do I don't say CD anymore. <laughs> 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 I'm dating myself. Um, but I put on my favorite music, or I hang out with my friends go have dinner with my friend, that does a lot. So she's exactly right, self-care, and it is very important because what everyone here does is very stressful. It is, it is. And so you do have to because you'll find yourself in a corner somewhere if you don't take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So she she is absolutely right. And I'll piggyback off of that, but myself, I love to shop. (laughs) <laughs> so I will go, I will hit up a mall, a shopping plaza, and I will come out de-stressed. <laughs> but I also take my kids to the park um, on the weekends and just let them run around, get some fresh air. And to me, that's de-stressing as well. Perfect. We call that retail therapy. I love a little retail therapy. Yes. <laughs> So, okay, what questions can you ask to tell if an employer supports women of color? Can you repeat that? What questions could you ask to tell if an employer supports women of color? Okay, so I'll, I'll take that first. You want to do research. You uh-huh. want to go on their website, and oftentimes there are pictures of employees there. They may have a DEI statement. There are ways that you can research a company. And then when you get into the interview, you can ask questions. Um, ask, you know, about the demographics of the agency. Um, not, I wouldn't go get too specific, mm-hmm. um, but there are ways to do it. Check, check for DEI statements, check the mission statement to see if, see if they have goals and objectives centered around HR uh, and staffing. So that's, that, that would be how I would check. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I totally agree with her. Um, I spoke about my experiences at the prison. That was early 2000s, so we're 2023, so things have drastically changed. Um, With the agency that I'm with now, we have a lot of African-American women in leadership positions. Um, If you go on our website, that's basically all you see um, on our photos, so yeah. And I agree as well. Facebook and Instagram, many organizations have Facebook and Instagram, social media now. Mm -hmm. So um, on our Facebook, you will see several pictures of the different health clinics that are offered in each county. And it also doesn't hurt, like she said, to do some background checking. Um, Go and visit the place. Go and see what the workers look like. See if that's something that you can see yourself working in and being and feeling comfortable. So do you have any advice for um, people who are not black women on how to support you in your workplace? I would say just listen, um, have an open ear for things, and um, don't really try to do things based off of color um, because, you know, everybody's different. You know, people don't, they don't really cater to because of color, but just be 
open-minded and um, just think with your heart. How would you want to be treated, you know, in the workplace? So things like that. Yeah, open mind, um, get rid of some of the biases that you may have, um, cultural competency, I guess I'm trying to say. <laughs> I would say uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Mm -hmm. um, it's, like you say, cultural competency. You want to make sure, be willing to listen, because sometimes people will tell you if something offended them. And, and listen with, with your heart, listen with your heart, and listen to learn, and not necessarily to just hear. That way it goes in one ear and out the other. Listen to learn and to be willing to accept that, okay, maybe that's not the best way to handle things. Maybe I can learn something here. Okay, mm -hmm. so active listening. <laughs> okay, so what advice would you give any black women entering um, your respective industries? For any industry, I would say get a mentor that's in your industry that you can talk to about what you're doing. Um, somebody that you don't want, I guess, a yes person. You want someone that's to mentor you that's going to be honest with you and open and tell you what they see. Because oftentimes, we make assumptions on our own. And they're all sometimes wrong assumptions. Um, I took a class, and I think she asked, she said, you do assertions versus assumptions. Assertions require research, and they're fact-based, fact-based. But assumptions are not. It's just what you think. So just make sure that you are making assertions rather than assumptions. If that makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> I, I would have, you summed it up. I don't even know how to come behind that. <laughs> but yeah, I would agree because counseling, it wasn't my, I was defects and I was child support. Counseling was something totally um, different for me. And so I did have to get a mentor um, and she was a wonderful mentor and and I, and, and I learned from her. So I, I found me someone positive, not just a, a yes person, as you said, um, someone who was, who, who was going to actually teach me something and not the shortcuts through the way. And, and may I say something else? Your mentor doesn't have to look like you. Right. Your mentor can be anybody that's willing to help you that has a genuine, a genuine desire to help you. Mm -hmm. So, and then you may want a mentor, you may want two or three mentors. You may want one that specializes in this area. Find someone, okay, know your weaknesses, and then find somebody that can help you through those weaknesses. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, for instance, I may not be good at um, public relations, so I find a mentor who is really good at public relations to kind of tutor me and tell me what I need to do. And then you need a general mentor for your profession. And I would also agree with that, even just going back to when I was a social worker at South Georgia Medical Center, I was appointed someone to teach me the ropes, and she did not look like me. But she was like a mother figure. Anytime I had any questions, anything, she was right there. And even when I was on my own, I could still call her and refer to her and ask her questions. And I told her, you know, I appreciated her for that. And there were others that, you know, did the same thing as well. But just for her being able to show me the roads, me being able to come back and vent to her and tell her when I wasn't treated fairly and for her to kind of say, well, if you weren't f treated fairly, then you need to do this. You need to do that. So just someone to kind of teach you the ropes and kind of, you know, help you along the way. Okay. Well, I think this is, we're coming up on the last question because, again, I didn't, I didn't write a lot of questions. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but the last question is um, if you could go back in time to the beginning of your career and give yourself a piece of advice, what would it be? It's okay to fail. It's okay to fail because that's how you learn. I think in, in our culture, we are, we are, it's very taboo mm -hmm. to fail. Mm -hmm. But truly, that's the only way you learn. That, that helps you. You won't make that mistake again. <laughs> if you fail, yeah. you learn. So 
So I remember the first time I tried to write a grant, I failed. But but I learned from that that process. So the next time I got the two hundred and fifty thousand mm dollars. -hmm. I would just say just continue to persevere. Um, never give up. When I was here at ABAC, I was going on my second year, and I had so many plans. I had mapped out my life, everything. And I turned out with child. You know, I found out that I was having my first son. And my world was over to me. But my mom, she was my biggest support. She encouraged me, and she told me that this is not the end. And three degrees later, I'm where I am now. So I would continue to say persevere, because like she said, you're, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to bump your head. You're going to get things wrong. But just continue on doing whatever it is that you want to do in life, because you will do it. And, and I'm looking at Dr. Rivers laughing. Because <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rivers was one of my professors. And I didn't do very well in his class. I, I failed. And I cried, and I cried, and I felt like the biggest failure and, and I was like you know what I'm just I'm just gonna go work somewhere and screw school or whatever but he taught me a lesson that whatever I did I had to give it my all and I couldn't do it halfway so I would say to you whatever you're doing don't do it not saying that you are but give it your 110 percent um I'm not three degrees later, but I'm, <laughs> I'm two degrees later. And I already had, I, I was, uh, I had two kids when I started um, ABAC. So I was a single parent um, working two jobs, coming here, um, and I was so afraid to fail. And I just wanted to succeed, 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 because I had so much, and don't listen to negative talk. Don't do that. And that was that was one of my issues that I was listening to the negative and not looking at the positives that I had. So just stay positive no matter how um, hard that road gets. It's always something at the end. And to me, it, failure is when you stop trying. May I add something to Please do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when I left grad school, my mom wrote me a letter. And she told me in that letter, Look for the good in everybody. Doesn't matter who they are. There is good in everybody. So look for that. That will help you along. That will help you along the way. That will keep you positive. That will keep a lot of. That will help you to be peaceful. Um, look for the good in everyone. And something that um, my first um, housing CEO taught me was that before you walk into a room with a problem, find a solution. It's something that he taught me when I was probably 25, and that has served me more than just about anything. You know what you want to do about the problem? You may not end up going that route, but at least you thought it through. You looked at all the different angles. So always have a solution when, before you take a problem to your supervisors. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. And I just wanted to say, when all of you guys were talking about failing, so my sister and I were um, having a conversation a while ago. Um, you know, we we're both of us are our biggest self critics or like we're our biggest critics. So like a lot of times we're like, Oh, we just feel so bad about how life is going and this, that and the third. But I have like I'm a very positive person. So, um, basically my advisor to her and myself was basically that, you know, it's not I don't consider a failure a failure, um, unless I didn't learn from it. So you know, I think I think that's just important. It's not you're not really failing if you you know take what take something from that situation. Mm -hmm. so. I agree. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, do any does anybody else have um, any questions or no? Do you guys have anything that you would like to say? Okay. Yes. Okay.
think you're going to fail exactly. because you've already if you if you think it it may happen yeah um i see a very bright young lady i see a, a future lawyer um don't think you're going to fail go in there giving it your more than a hundred percent go in there giving it your all and i want an invitation when you pass that bar <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, and confidence. Have have that confidence. Don't go in there, oh, I'm the only black or woman in there. Don't go in there with that attitude. Go in there with, I'm gonna be the best lawyer that there is. That that's what I that would be my advice. You already are the best. That's right. <laughs> you that's already right. are. <laughs> anything goes? Doctor Rivers, you wanna say anything? <laughs> yes, um, as I, as I progressed from my, my baccalaureate to master's to doctorate degree, uh, the black male become, became even more scarce. And I didn't, I didn't see the brother uh, by the time I got to master's degree. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I saw the sisters. Black women was there. And, uh, I was encouraged by that. But uh, how can you as black women encourage I do it every single day. <laughs> I know you do. I do it every, um, and what I notice um, at the agency that I'm at is a lot of uh, black males don't have a, a high school diploma. So I encourage that GED. I encourage after you get that, I encourage education just to, to make a long story short. I encourage them, um, some of them are unemployed. And so when they come to me and they say, uh, Ms. Edwards, I have a job interview, but I don't have a suit. Okay, so what do you have? Go in there clean. Go in there with your, don't have your pants set. And go in there with a belt on. Because some, we all know that they can't afford a suit. And personally, I can't buy them a suit. So I just always try to encourage you to get that education. Always make yourself presentable to someone. And then I have, I, I just tell them they are somebody because in the uh, population that I that I deal with, a lot of them have never heard "you can do it" or "congratulations" or "thank you." You know, they they, they haven't heard that. So I try to build their self-esteem mainly, um, and just just try to be that positive person because when they walk through those doors, they encounter so much negativity behind them. So I just want to be that light for them. And working in higher ed and progressive through higher ed, there's so much disparity between black males and black females. Yes. In higher ed just alone. Yes. So that's, that's why I asked that. In my own experience, mm -hmm. I saw the disappearance of black males as I mm -hmm. got on the ladder of the master's doctorate. Yep. You know, around you wouldn't never. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Just continuing on what you said, just continuing to encourage them, listen to them, because a lot of the things that they face, we may not. So we may not know what's going on in their head or what issues they may face coming up. And just going back to my husband and my son, I asked them, you know, how was your day? You know, and stuff like that. Just listening to what they have to say and then just giving them an encouraging word and then also relating it back to education. You know, once you get that, that's something they can't take from you. Yeah. So just continuing to encourage them and giving them aspirations and, you know, telling them things that they can say on a day-to-day -day basis. Make a five-year plan because you can achieve it. You just got to want to. And, and that's what I've always done is just encourage. Um, I have uh, a brother. He's 12 years younger than me. He went into the military and he came out and went to school and decided that at some point that it was just too much for him. And we just sat down and had a very frank talk. You can do this, you just have to put in the work. And he went on to get his degree in four years, and now he's gainfully employed. So um, just encouragement, that's, that's the, the bottom line. Um, what we do and what we know, uh, and I guess in the education system, as well as in our housing area, we know that if children are shown love when they are three or four years old, they are going. They are more than likely going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And so you have to love people. 
and you have to love people where they are. Yep. You can't mm -hmm. love them where you think they should be. They, it has to be where they are, mm -hmm. uh, unconditionally. Thank you. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, um, I guess the takeaway from this is to love yourself unconditionally and to love other people unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. you prepare for what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Have the freedom to persevere and to see it through. Mm -hmm. That's right. Be yourself and remember to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That is really, really all you need to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you have to go out there and do it. You cannot be handed to you. Like, At all. Right. That's, right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Young, mm -hmm. when our parents were young. Mm -hmm. So you put in the work, you do what you need to. You actually do get the reward. Mm -hmm. You do. It's nice to be living now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That is it. Let's sing a song. I'm joking. <laughs> 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 Well, thank you guys for yes, having us. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it. Thank y'all for coming and sharing with us. <laughs> yes, we want to thank our, our panelists as well as our moderator. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us tonight. Uh, don't forget, we have the uh, lecture on Thursday night, Dr. Barbara Combs uh, from Kennesaw State University. She'll be talking about her book. Um, bodies Out of Place, uh, theorizing against anti-blackness in U.S. society. So uh, that will be on how auditorium at 6 o'clock on Thursday night. So uh, that will be our culminating event for Black History Month. So thank you all for coming, students, faculty, administrators, and again, our panelists and moderators, we thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.